All right. <laughs> I am I am excited. I'm excited for this. So this is going to be uh, hopefully uh, a lecture series of all 10 elegies from uh, Rana Maria Rilke's Duino elegies. Um, so the, these these lectures are meant to really serve as you know entry points for anybody that hasn't read them or maybe people that don't understand them. But again, my lecture is mainly to be a provocation and also uh, as a way to sort of for us to kind of, uh, you know, milk, <laughs> milk the wisdom that we can get from, from, from these poems, you know, what, what can we gain from reading these elegies? What can we understand about death? about love, about sadness. Um, I believe even childhood is in here. What, how, how do we grapple with that? And I believe a lot of these elegies have to do with how to live, how, how do we deal with death and, and human existence and being lost in the world. So how I'm gonna begin this lecture is actually quoting a passage by Re Rachel Corbett uh, she wrote a biography on on Rilke, and and I thought this was a wonderful passage because it actually kind of paints the beginning of him starting the Duino elegies, uh, and and here it is. It took place on a gusty January day in Duino, the cold northern wind from the Hungarian lowlands could collide with warm gales coming up from the Sahara Desert and cause storms as apocalyptic as an El Greco painting. On one such afternoon, Rilke stepped out for some air. Just as the sky was darkening, he was too preoccupied with an important letter he had to write to, note, to notice the weather. From the castle, the princess watched him pacing the cliff, hands jammed in his pockets, head bowed in thought. Then he heard a voice in the wind, quote, who if I cried out would hear me among the angels' hierarchies, end quote, it said. Rilke stopped in his tracks and listened. He wrote the sentence down in his notebook and with it, the first line of his Duino elegies. When he went back inside the castle, the rest of the poem poured out of him. In describing the surge of inspiration to Andrea Salome, he admitted that he hardly felt like it, like its author at all. He felt like he had been inhabited by a higher power. Quote, the voice which is using me is greater than I, end quote. So it is here where the Dueno elegies begin. And also where our journey begins by placing us in a cry for help. And yet none can help us. Quote, Neither angels nor man, and the animals already know by instinct, we're not comfortably at home in our translated world. As if we can, as if we cannot accept or cannot understand that we should not contain our emptiness, for the night always comes to greet and remind us. And here I quote some lines from the first elegy. Express this. Quote, and the night, oh, the night when the wind, full of outer space, gnaws at our faces, that wished for gentle, deceptive one waiting painfully for the lonely heart. She stay on for anyone. Is she easier on lovers? But they use each other to hide their fate. You still don't understand. Throw the emptiness in your arms out into that space we breathe. Maybe birds will feel the air thinning as they fly deeper into themselves, end quote. Perhaps what Rilke is saying is that our emptiness is life-affirming, a life-giving gift, our mission. Here he continues, quote, 
Yes, springs needed you. Many stars waited for you to see them. A wave that had broken long ago swelled towards you. Or when you walked by an open window, a violin gave itself. All that was your charge. But could you live up to it? Weren't you always distracted by hope, as if all this promised you a lover? End quote. This provocation, however, is one to dwell with. Because even if we had this so-called lover, what would we have done with her? Rilke asserts we would have placed her where all of our, quote, strange and heavy thoughts are going in and out, end quote. Then reality, these passions are still not immortal enough. If we are going to love, we must aim our heights to those we find deserted and even envied because they manage to love us more than we love them. But this should not be misunderstood as hopeless or grim. On the contrary, this is our chance to begin again, to meet our death with a heroic fall, quote, an excuse for another life, a final birth, end quote. Rilke mentions Gaspar Stampa as an example to remember, a poet who is abandoned by her lover while she mourns in melancholy, where girls often wish, quote, if only I could be like her, end quote. Have we not learned from this age-old suffering to make something more productive from this? Rilke wants us to transform this love which frees us from those we love. Instead, we should become more than what we are, quote, because to stay is to be nowhere, end quote. So how do we begin this process of becoming more? And this Rilke grants a start. We are encouraged to listen and hear, quote, the endless news growing out of silence, rustling towards you from those who died young, end quote. Whichever voices we hear, whether in Rome or Naples, we are meant to remove the, peer, the, the perceived injustice so those spirits can move a little less unhindered. Though these spirits are perhaps spirits of the dead, I, I believe we can also interpret this as parts and voices of ourselves that have not moved on. Rilke points out that yes, it, it is hard not living on this earth anymore. And all the hopes and dreams that we had towards constructing a future for ourselves However, these absolutes between the dead and the living couldn't be further from the truth. For even the, quote, angels, they say, can't tell whether they, they move among the living or the dead. The eternal torrent hurls all ages through both realms forever and drowns out their voices in both, end quote. Whichever is the case, the earth is kind to those that have left us too soon by slowly winning them off. But for us who are living that need these mysteries, quote, whose source of blessed progress so often is our sadness, could we exist without them, end quote. Uh, this sadness, according to Rilke, is our key source for becoming more than what we are where well, we can fling our emptiness as a life-affirming creative tool, like when the lament for Linos was, quote, the first daring music that pierced the barren numbness, end quote. And where the void first felt, quote, the vibration which charms and comforts and helps us now, end quote. If only we would listen to this sadness in all that is mourning within and around us, will, will we be able to sublimate what we are to uh, hopefully become more than what we are? Uh, and, and for those that don't know, uh, Linos, Linos is basically the personification of uh, lament or sadness. Uh, I actually, uh, I really enjoyed this um, this first elegy because it really kind of just the way it begins, right? It, it calls out for a cry of help 
and then it ends with a a hopeful a hopeful source like we we already have that source within us but ironically it's not man himself it's what resides in us it's that sadness that 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 um and if if we listen to those to those dead spirits uh which i like again i like to interpret that as the things that we let that we we didn't give them a proper death let's put it that way because uh, roka talks about that these spirits they just want for us to wipe away that perceived injustice about their death um and and i believe that in order for us to become more than what we are we have to do this first we have to listen we have to uh, put to rest those those spirits those uh, parts of ourselves that we didn't give a proper death and and once we can do that we can achieve this emptiness that uh, can can become a, a life affirming tool for 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 creation for us to engage with life um, anyways I, I hope you guys uh, enjoyed the this first lecture um you know again this is just meant to serve as a an entry point to to see what what poetry can offer us and and more about what what rilke can offer us and i'm trying to be you know faithful to that uh, as much as i can and that's why there's you know there's a lot of quoting but at the same time I'm also kind of giving my uh, some of my spin on it, especially with uh, uh, the the dead spirits and so on. But I think it's it, it's good to note that for Rilke, to distinguish between the living and the dead is is, is sort of a that's a that's a harm that we've done with ourselves. That eternity is flowing through both of those realms, and we can't actually distinguish them at all because as he, as he states, uh, it, it drowns out both of their voices, the eternal torrent. Uh, so anyways, I hope you guys enjoyed that uh, first lecture and hopefully I can get going on the second lecture. I think it, it's going to get interesting. There's lots to talk about with the, other remaining elegies um, we got ranging from childhood to yeah, I think one of my favorite lines is like ha ha when a happy thing falls. <laughs> so yeah, there, there's there's a lot to talk about, um, and of course the the main theme is going to be about death, about sadness, and how we can grapple with that. Uh, so again, anyways, thank you guys for listening. Hope you guys take care.